Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. Here are some Linux, open source and privacy news for the first half of July 2020. This month we've got more market share growth, a great productivity app being brought back from the dead and Nvidia going open source with their SDK to help gaming on Linux. Let's take a look. According to a very serious statistical study that I definitely didn't just make up, 88.33% of YouTube creators are weird biological machines that spit out videos in exchange for food in their bellies. If you're willing to help me fill my gut and support what I do, please stick around. If you'd rather let me work on an empty stomach, you can go to the designated timecode below to skip this little segment. For those who are unaware, I started a Linux gaming channel recently where I play games that run on Linux natively or through Proton. I've completed a Metro Exodus playthrough and I've got a Subnautica and Stellaris series running currently, so if you want to see a scared idiot trying to avoid being eaten by sea monsters or fail to master the complex mechanics of space politics, head over there. I'll ask you guys to vote on the next game I'll play after I finish each series, so subscribe there to give me your input. If you want to help support what I do, I've now enabled YouTube memberships and I have a Patreon page. Members and patrons get access to a monthly patron cast where I talk about Linux, myself, the channel and whatever else I'm working on at the moment. And they also get to vote on which video topics I'll cover next month. If you're feeling generous and like what I do, don't hesitate to join. I'll leave links to all of this in the description of the video. That's it for this segment, now on to your news. July the 2nd. The Linux market share can't seem to stop growing. For the third month in a row, Linux has gained market share, as reported by NetMarketShare. It passed 3.6% in June compared to 3.17% in May. It seems driven by the rise of Ubuntu again, and it still doesn't include Chrome OS, so it's really just Linux growing. Since this growth has been there for 3 months, it's probably also not an error. It just seems that our platform might have reached a point where it can grow bit by bit and reach a reasonable market share. OpenSUSE Leap 15.2 was released. It brings a bunch of new packages for machine learning and AI, including TensorFlow or PyTorch, and a real-time kernel has been added. Kubernetes is also included as an official package. It offers a choice between KDE Plasma 5.18 or GNOME 3.36, as well as the latest version of XFCE. OpenSUSE is not a distro I've used much in the past, but this looks like a solid release, especially for servers or AI developers. Chrome OS might get access to Steam through an Ubuntu VM. The Borealis project will bring full Ubuntu with Steam pre-installed to Intel 10th gen based Chromebooks, and that will run in a virtual machine. With the measly graphics hardware of Chromebooks and the fact that it will run in a VM, I'd say it's more of a marketing gimmick or a way for people to play less intensive games and stream the bigger ones from their main PCs, but it's still nice to see Google relying on Linux to do that. They didn't really have another choice though. Purism has released their Librem 14 laptop, and damn it looks good. While I've been critical of their Librem 5 efforts, their laptops actually have a pretty good reputation and could have been candidates for my next work laptop, but even if this thing has a 6-core Intel CPU with up to 32GB of RAM and great simple design, it still lacks the dedicated GPU and French keyboard I need. Privacy conscious people might find this machine to be a really interesting one though, since it brings kill switches for the Wi-Fi, Intel on mic and the webcam. July the 3rd. Wine 5.12 was released bringing support for the WebSocket API, bringing more DLLs to the PE format and updating the Vulkan spec. It also fixes 48 bugs, including for Wing Commander 4, Battle.net, League of Legends, Star Citizen or Divinity Original Sin 2. July the 4th. DuckDuckGo reappeared in India after being gone since the 1st of July. The reason for its unavailability wasn't clear, with users speculating that the Indian government blocked it or that DNS lookups were failing. Since India had blocked more than 50 China-based apps, DuckDuckGo might have been mistakenly thrown in the lot before someone realized their mistake. Suffice to say, whatever happens, governments should not have the right to ban stuff from the local internet, except if they really are in breach of a specific law. July the 6th. Proton already had DXVK for DirectX 9, 10 and 11 games, and now it has VKD3D for DirectX 12 games. The library is now an official part of the Proton distribution, with Valve developers picking up the project after its founder passed away. The project will undergo a good amount of changes and will probably break compatibility with older graphics card and hardware, but should bring in more performance as a trade-off. With the new privacy invasive laws being passed in Hong Kong, Facebook and Twitter announced that they wouldn't comply with data requests emanating from the local government, which is great. What would be even greater would be if they didn't comply with any of those requests, wherever the government, anywhere in the globe, since the data people input there is private and shouldn't be shared with anyone. I'd wager this means these services will probably be banned in Hong Kong pretty soon. July the 7th. 
Getting Things Gnome, an older productivity-focused app for Gnome that had been forgotten and cast aside, has now been resurrected. Its first new release, version 0.4, is now available on FlatHub with a more modern, head of our powered interface and hundreds of bug fixes. It's fantastic to see older, abandoned applications being picked up by a new team, and Getting Things Gnome is a really good one, on the same level as Planner, so don't hesitate to give it a shot. July the 8th. Canonical and Google are teaming up to bring Flutter to Linux. Flutter is a cross-platform app development framework based on Dart. While apps built with this framework don't really look native in any capacity, they still can look and feel pretty awesome, far better than basic Electron apps. I must admit I have a strong preference for native apps, but since it might enable developers to bring more applications to Linux easily, I won't be too picky. July the 10th. NVIDIA open sourced their NV API SDK. It's the core NVIDIA SDK that allows people to access the hardware on Windows machines. This gives the DXVK team something to sink their teeth in, as it will allow them to better understand and use NVIDIA GPUs in Wine and Proton instead of spoofing an AMD GPU. The fact that NVIDIA open sourced it to enable open source re-implementations of NV API for Windows emulation environments probably also means that they specifically aim to help the Wine, Proton and DXVK teams. Microsoft won't support PHP for Windows anymore. Starting with PHP for Windows version 8, Microsoft won't provide any support for it, although some other team can take up the packaging and support duties. Microsoft states that WSL is enough to run PHP, and this is interesting, because it means that Microsoft would rather people use PHP on Linux than on Windows, even if it's a version of Linux that runs on Windows. July the 13th. The Linux kernel will no longer use the terms blacklist, whitelist, master or slave. This comes at a time where people are more aware of sensitive terms. I'm not going to go into that debate here, let's just say that if a terminology offends people, I don't see why we wouldn't change it, especially since it has basically no impact on how the Linux kernel works. It seems a lot of other projects are also going to migrate from these previous terminologies, so it shouldn't be too complicated to adopt. July the 15th. The Pine64 released a new, more powerful Pine phone equipped with 3GB of RAM and accompanied by a USB dock that lets users use the phone as a full desktop. This new version should run a little bit better than the previous one I got, which was pretty slow in its early days. It will sell for $199, which is a very reasonable price, and I'd recommend you go for this one instead of the base model if you want to dabble with a Linux phone. And that's it for this video! I hope you guys enjoyed, if you did don't stay to like, subscribe and turn on notifications. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!